It may come as a surprise to some that many of today's modern Bible translations have removed and changed the meanings and uses of specific words that don't align with the Trinitarian doctrine. For instance, only begotten. It's quite a self-explanatory term, really. The only one begotten. As a sample, let's read Matthew 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Here we see the word begat, which has a lot in common with the word begotten in both the English and Biblical Greek. True, we don't forget only begotten sons have also acquired from birth special rights and privileges as only begotten sons. The point is they have those special rights and privileges from the very instant they were born, begat, begotten. But as Wayne Grudem writes in his book Systematic Theology on page 294, in the year 1886 scholars have changed the definition of only begotten to mean only or unique, completely disregarding the begettle overtones, as one writer puts it. So in nearly every modern Bible, the words only begotten simply aren't there in any of the six scriptures where they appear in the King James Bible. They were completely removed by Trinitarian thinking. I can't help but wonder about the uninspired creeds commonly recited among Trinitarians. For example, the Nicene Creed speaks of Jesus as the only begotten Son, begotten of His Father. This creed still uses the original definition of begotten. Or how about the Athanasian Creed, which brings out that the Son is begotten, yet the Father is not begotten. Does this mean the Father is not only or unique? Or will they come out with the modern revised English version of the Nicene Creed? Or maybe the new literal standard version of the Athanasian Creed? All of these creeds, in addition to volumes of books, theses, lectures, and sermons, are required and written in order to try and explain the Trinity. Yet, when we look and study only begotten and the Greek monogonies, the words are very self-explanatory, self-defining, self-evident. Still, Trinitarians must revise the usage of such words in order to suit their a priori, their premeditated thinking. Another rethinking of a simple word is firstborn. Again, a very common word in English and Greek, prototokos, one that was born first, self-explanatory, self-defining, self-evident, and, like only begotten, one that was firstborn also has preeminence in rank. He received this preeminence in rank because he was born first, a typical yet flexible practice in Bible times. We can look at it this way. Today, we have a well-known idiom, he or she was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. It's generally understood to imply someone was rich, but more than that, she was rich from the time she was born. So it makes two points. One, that she was rich, and two, she has been so from the time she was born. The very same comparison with firstborn. God's Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to use a word that makes two points. One, Jesus has preeminence of rank, and two, he had it since he was born, begotten or created. This leads into another change or revision in modern evangelical Bibles in Revelation 3.14. The King James Bible and the New World Translation translates it as Jesus is the beginning of creation by God. RK is the Greek word John used for beginning. He uses it numerous times throughout his writings. Every time he does, it's translated as beginning. Trinitarians take exception to Jesus being created, so they have to change what John was saying to Jesus is the head of creation, or the likes. But nowhere else in John's inspired writings is the usage of the word RK changed from beginning. Only here, because not changing it conflicts with the Trinitarian doctrine. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to bother changing this one, 
and make it the only exception. Our next example of Trinitarian tampering of God's Word in Philippians 2 verse 6, the King James Bible and virtually all of the older translations write, speaking of Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. Does it kind of sound like Jesus wouldn't even give it thought to robbing equality with God? If so, couldn't that mean Jesus really wasn't equal to God in the first place if he had to rob equality with God? Interestingly, that is what the Greek word harpagmos means, to rob or snatch something that you don't have. This and other forms of harpagmos are found in the Bible and the Greek Septuagint, where we read of wolves that snatch up sheep, birds that rob seeds. Outside of the Bible, harpagmos is used to tell of people that kidnap and snatch kids. As Jason Debune's Truth in Translation writes, every one of these related words has to do with the seizure of something not yet one's own. There is not a single word derived from harpazio that is used to suggest holding on to something already possessed. This word clearly shows Jesus couldn't have had equality with God in the first place, since he was yet to rob or snatch it from God. Well, what's a Trinitarian to do? The usual, change the definition. The more recently published Theological Dictionary of the New Testament on page 473 also acknowledges harpagmos to mean actively take something and adds that in non-Christian writings it is found only in this sense. But notice what they write next. The word then took on the sense and came to mean what is seized. It then came to be used. These are transitioning words of revision and change. Yes, the definition was recently changed. God inspired Paul to use a word that people then commonly knew that it meant to seize what you don't have. Trinitarians have since assigned a new unique application of this word and redefined it. And in a way that many scholars acknowledge isn't used that way anywhere else. Now, how about the word God? We know, one, it's used for the true God, and we know, two, it's used for false gods, but does even God himself use the word with another third option? Yes, believe it or not, God is used to describe certain qualities of people and angels that have godly qualities, power, or godly authority. Scriptural examples, in Exodus 21 verse 6, God calls the judges of Israel gods in that they have authority. Is God saying those judges are the true God or false gods? Neither. Yet God still calls them gods. Same with the angels that God calls gods. In Psalm 82 verses 1 and 6, God calls his children gods. Is God saying those children are the true God or are false gods? Neither. Yet God still does call them gods. Thus, we see there is actually indeed a third usage application for the word God. In John 10 verses 34 to 36, Jesus himself agrees with this by quoting Psalm 82 verse 6, showing God calls people gods and the scripture cannot be broken. We can and do read of Jesus being called God, but this does not insist on meaning he is the one true God or to a false God, but instead the scriptural third usage of the word God. He has qualities of God and sooner than any other being really. After all, if God calls humans and angels gods, it would certainly be fitting for one that is born, begotten, or created even higher than humans or angels to be called God. But do Trinitarians look at the word God with the same usage the inspired scriptures do? My 50 plus years of discussing a Trinity demonstrates they know there's a true God, they know there's a false God, but that's about it. No scripturally based third option. And again, they change or limit the biblical usage of God to suit their long established thinking. 
Aren't we behooved to ask which translations are truly biased? But it doesn't end there either. How about the word worship? Yes, worship does mean offering sacred service to God, but it too has an additional meaning. Worship also includes the customary act of humbly bowing down to regular people for various reasons, typically to show them that they're worthy of honor. When the 400 plus year old King James Version was first written, worship did cover both definitions. Today, we now need two different words to cover the two different meanings or applications of the word worship. Yes, worship also entails simply a display of showing honor to one we deem worthy of honor and respect, even in a non-religious way. We almost never see it that way, and how often do we ourselves honor someone by falling at their feet? Though, it still happens in other cultures to this day. Human officials in England continue to be addressed as your worship. Let's look into the book, Biblical Words and Their Meaning, An Introduction to Lexical Semantics by Moises Silva. On page 205, here we read, The writings of Josephus clearly show that in addition to entreaty, proskuneo was the verb employed to refer to the action performed to express political homage when a person of lesser station approached a nobleman, king, or queen. In this context, it refers to a gesture of allegiance from one human being to another, probably referring to some type of genuflection. Again, it would be misleading to translate proskuneo by the English word worship, especially exclusively. But no surprise, some Trinitarian translations and scholars often ignore the secular application of worship, or the Greek word proskuneo, and incorrectly restrict it and limit it to mean only godly worship with no sense of a humble bowing down or obeisance, in which is indeed a large part of the usage of such words. Yes, many Trinitarians we speak with will insist worship applies only to God. They do so mainly because of their Trinitarian doctrine. Other changes in recent centuries, Trinitarians have quite passionately discovered various rules of grammar that no one ever imagined for thousands of years. Cowell's rule, or Granville Sharp's rule, very reminiscent of the Old Testament's wa consecutive. Rules discovered motivated by trying to harmonize the Bible with preconceived Trinitarian thinking. I can't help but wonder why weren't such rules discovered by secularists studying non-religious literature? Of course, it isn't just various rules they discovered. As noted, they also have very wordy creeds, volumes of books, essays, lectures, sermons, and such that are all required to try and explain the Trinity, since the inspired Bible or its writers didn't write anything that expounds on or explains the Trinity. I wonder why. Perhaps one reason why people accept the Trinity doctrine is the buddy system. Can so many of their friends, including the scholarly, be so wrong? Well, if we were to think like that, isn't it true that scholarly atheists and intellectual evolutionists rival or even outnumber the Christian ranks? A whole lot of somebody has to be wrong. Let's look at it the way Jesus looks at it in his Sermon on the Mount. Remember, he said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do so many powerful works? How does Jesus respond to those very deed-accomplishing Christians? He says, Get away from me, ye workers of lawlessness. Broad and spacious is the road to destruction, and many find it. Narrow and cramped is the road to life, and few find it. Yes, the buddy system does not a good barometer make. Well, what about that the Trinity doctrine being so firmly established since the time of the founding of the Church Fathers? Hasn't the test of time proven anything? Aren't we standing on the shoulders of many great religious people of the past? Well, first of all, what if everyone thought like that? 
we may not have ever had a Protestant Reformation. Some Catholics may not mind that, though. Next, we must consider the words of Jesus when he told the very educated and scholarly scribes and Pharisees, You have made the word of God invalid because of your traditions. And really, what is orthodoxy but a word quite synonymous with tradition? Thirdly, we need to keep in mind those founding church fathers weren't inspired by God. A lot of false teachings have crept in in the 300 plus years since the time of Jesus and the Apostle Paul. Sadly, it's true, many barnacles have clung to the long floating ark of the Bible. So, modern Trinitarian Bible translations change or modify only begotten, firstborn, beginning of creation, robbery, worship, God, and more. They also discover rules and laws of grammar that no other doctrine requires. They may justify their Trinitarian beliefs since many of their friends believe it, but those friends may justify their beliefs because the first friends believe it. It's quite circular reasoning, really. And they fall back on traditions and orthodox teachings that require creeds, volumes of writings, lectures, sermons, and theses, and more. In many cases, there are people that accept those things sooner than what's written in the inspired Word of God, the ultimate and only true authority. And what about the many various interpretations of the Trinity? Some people will say they understand it. Others will say you can't understand the Trinity. While even others say, if you think you understand the Trinity, you don't understand the Trinity. Yes, it's just a mystery. But let's pause and think of this. God created his only begotten firstborn son. Together, they created the heavens and the earth. Notice how brief, clear, and concise that simple scriptural truth is. God created his only begotten firstborn son. Together, they created the heavens and the earth. Requires no creeds, very little expounding, is easily understood, and no confusion, and nothing mysterious. Might Occam's razor come into play here? And this provides the best scriptural foundation to springboard the rest of our biblical understanding from. God created his only begotten firstborn son. Together they created the heavens and the earth.